Well, okay. Let's uh, launch this thing. First slide, Tim. I'll say, Tim, next one, and he'll go to it. Okay. <laughs> Friendship, circumstances, and fans. The story you were about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Listen, nobody endorses this. Thing. My wife won't even endorse this. She won't listen to it. So don't blame anybody. If things you don't like, it's my fault. Okay, go to the next slide. I want to take you back in history, move you north a little bit to where I hail from. But first, I, I want to share about Tamara Butler. This program really began about 10 years ago. We had a, a focus in education at that time. It's really become more focused now on uh, innovation. And so I wanted to try to find innovations that I could use in a program to show to educational people that came through JSD. And I came across Tamara Butler's series. And what she had done, she had looked at all the contributions of African Americans in the area of invention and design and so forth. So the idea was, what if we didn't have those kinds of things? Where would we be as a country? Well, that's the really the genesis of this program. So let's go to the next one. And you're going to go with me and through my eyes, you're going to see the actual experiences. Every black and white person should consider this question, and as I did, as I just said years ago, that uh, what would life be like if you didn't have the contributions of, of, of African Americans to your life? Okay, go to the next one. Now here's the first one as we go back in time, the time machine. NASA hasn't come up with this yet, but I did. <laughs> so we're zooming north. Northwest Indiana. Now we're coming down to where I was raised. In 1942, my parents bought this home. My dad had come back from World War II, Battle of the Ball. And here's where we settled. That's me as a six-year-older, 1948, 1950. Now here's my point. Everything's white. White snow, white house, <laughs> white Christmas, and white paint. There wasn't one African-American family in my whole city of 20,000 people. So how was I ever going to be able to communicate and get to understand that we were going to be able to relate together as one people to another? How is this going to happen? Well, this is the hand of God's providence that I want to share with you. So go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's my home right here. Here is a public links golf course called Wicker Park. At Wicker Park, it's about 30 miles from South Chicago. And in those days, in that era, the courses were not very friendly to African-American golfers. And for that reason, the pro at this golf course, which was just blocks from my house, had opened his heart and his course to invite African-American golfers to come down to this part of Northwest Indiana. And here would be athletes, there would be doctors, lawyers, some of the finest men in the United States, and they would come down here to play golf, and I had the privilege, go to the next slide, of caddying for them. This is how I made money on Saturday weekend. I would caddy for these gentlemen that would come in their cars down to Wicker Park. And so, let me show you the next uh, video, and you can see how I would walk over to the course, okay? Tim, go to the next one. And here I would be, here I'd be. I'd be leaving my house, I'd be going up, turning the car. This guy got me in trouble. We went and stole toys out of that guy's house. <laughs> and so, here we I'd go up the street, you know, hoping to be able to caddy for one of these gentlemen and, and make some money that Saturday afternoon. Well, they drove up in their cars and we sat back here behind the clubhouse and this gentleman came out and said, my caddy's not here. Would you caddy for me, son? I said, oh, I'd love to caddy for you, sir. Well, this guy was a powerful man. He hit that first drive off the tee. It sailed down that par 5 fairway way beyond this ditch. It's 150 yards of, of, from the tee. And, and he looked like Tiger Woods, you know. It was like 320 yards. Well, the thing about him that impressed me is he treated me like I was not his caddy. He treated me like I was a member of the foursome. He asked me about my life. He asked me about what I wanted to pursue. He asked me about, did I like sports? Oh, 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 that was a good question for me. I loved them. He asked me about academics and so forth. 
But the thing about it was, he treated me with respect, and he treated me with love, and he showed me what it is to appreciate somebody else. So at the end of the day, when he was leaving, and I waved goodbye to him, I turned to one of the other caddies, I said to him, you know, I have had the most wonderful time for the last four hours because of that gentleman. Who is that man? He said, don't you know who you're just caddying for? I said, no. You just caddied for America's greatest Olympian, Jesse Owens, to go to the next slide. And this man encouraged me, like at a young age, when I needed somebody that would, an adult figure, that would show me what it was important to be. And, and he, here, I had never met another African American, really. And, and this man was really the first one I met. And so, as a result of that, he set my life on the right course, and I wanted to show you this YouTube about what kind of a man Jesse Owen was. So go to the next slide. If there's one man who will exemplify the ultimate Olympic hero, it is America's Jesse Owens. His achievements, though equal since in the record books, are as remarkable for the dignity and grace in which they were performed as for the barriers they broke. Surrounded by Nazi propaganda and its doctrine of alien superiority, Owens became the dominant figure of the 1936 games in Berlin. He was cheered every time he entered the stadium and treated like a star. He was, after all, the fastest man in the world, black or white. Owens won the 100 meters with relative ease from his teammate Ralph Metcalf. The 200 meters saw a bigger margin of victory, breaking the Olympic record by almost half a second. He completed the sprint treble by helping the American 4x100 meter relay field to a 12 yard victory with a world record that would stand for 20 years. His fourth gold medal proved to be more of a battle. Owens almost failed to qualify for the long jump, until his main right, the German Lutz Long, suggested that he move his mark back and make sure of a safe, legal jump. Once in the final, Owens and Long battled out in front of a strongly partisan crowd. When Long actually equaled Owens' jump, the German crowd erupted in excitement. Owens responded with an even longer leap then sealed his victory with a new Olympic record with his final jump. In front of Hitler, the 100,000 crowd, Lutz Long was the first person to congratulate Owens, cementing a friendship that was to last until Long was killed at the Battle of San Pietro in 1943. Recalling his feelings at the time, Owens later said, you can melt down all the medals and cups I have, and they wouldn't be a plating for the 24 carat friendship I felt for Lutz Long at that moment. That really captures the whole spirit of what we're all about and what I wanted to share with everybody here today. This relationship that we can have and we, we do have and it's a blessing. It's, it's only God inspired. Well, go to this next one. I want to show you what I think this was in the, in, in the, my future. This was another man at Wicker Park I met. 28th of June, 1939. What a powerful guy. So who? Round one. I looked at that guy, man, he looked like he could go into the ring right now with anybody in the whole planet. And he was 20 years past the heavyweight championship. A powerful man. And these men would actually play together and, and golf and they fellowship together. But they treated the caddy very well. And we all appreciated that. And uh, then, then, as a result of that, I met another man. And he would... And the referee stops the fight. It's all... Yes, go to the next one. This guy was named Dick Night Train Lane. Now, if you follow pro football, this guy... Night Train! Dick Night Train Lane is the only player in NFL history to have a James Brown song named after him. And that's of course, you count the other man's 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 Will Smith, who we'll get to later in the series. Anyway, during his 14 seasons with the Rams, the Cardinals, and the Lions, Night Train Lane proved himself... They had the 19 days next time. Listen to this. There he goes. He was a Ram, he came to Chicago Cardinals in 54, and that's why I got to meet him. rookie season, Lane had 14 interceptions, an NFL record which still stands, unlike most of his opponents. Because as well as being one of the best, Lane was probably the most physical cornerback the game's ever seen. His speciality, still legal in those days, was the clothesline tackle. The night train neckties of the <laughs> There's the night train neckties. All aboard! The night train! But I can remember Nitrate, he'd come up and he had Bermuda shorts on 
and he had this bill and a, 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 a golfer's cap, and he always had a car. He had full of these bag boy carts, you know. I guess he'd just come to Chicago Cardinals, and they didn't pay pro football athletes in those days. So he usually didn't get a caddy, but he was really a wonderful gentleman, and he kind of pranced around. I can imagine why he'd be a great football player, because he had the agility that one should have. So this is really key, this next one I want to show you, because when Jesse Owens, Jesse Owens was actually defeated by Ralph Metcalf as a collegiate runner. Ralph went to Marquette University, and of course Jesse was a uh, Ohio State graduate, but Ralph became a congressman from Chicago. And I would watch when I caddied for those two gentlemen, really for Jesse, they would talk about media things and they were just good friends. And that friendship started in college and, and actually Ralph was the runner-up to Jesse in the 100 meters in the Olympics. But the nice thing about this is it was Ralph that was instrumental in there actually being a Black History Month. And I met the man that was there to do it in Congress. So I feel like very blessed to have been that part of my life. So go to the next one. Okay, now this was the era when rock and roll was coming in. And of course, I loved rock and roll stuff, being a guy of the 50s. And there are two great rock and rollers. Now, a lot of people say Elvis is the greatest, but there are a lot of people that disagree with you because they think Chuck Berry is the greatest rock and roll uh, man. And of course, you know uh, Maybelline is it and uh, Go Johnny Go and first things like that. So this was one song I really loved, and I'm going to do a karaoke on this song. So watch this one right now. We're doing karaoke on this one. <laughs> up in the morning, off to school. The teacher teaching the golden rule. came into my own. You know, I in my future. This made my life. This was the thing that brought me to Johnson Space Center for the manned spacecraft. So go to the next one and we'll see what brought me here. The kids love this, but summer school when I talk to them, yeah, I do a little. Okay, here's the point on this. If you want to be popular with the young ladies, you better be a star basketball Okay, so I do a feasibility study in the early days. I would watch the basketball guy. Guy that scored 20 points. He'd go out on one side of the gymnasium. All these good-looking cheerleaders would follow him. I went out the other side as an academic, and nobody followed me. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, here it is. We're going to weigh two uh, courses of action. I better be a star basketball player. And so I practiced, I practiced, I practiced, and I practiced. And I went to bed one night. I had a 10-point-a-game average. I stood a centimeter over six foot. And uh, basically, I wasn't going to get a basketball scholarship. And that was my dream. But I had a dream one night, and in this dream I was in an enormous auditorium, it's like Huffies, and I was playing basketball. And I never missed the shot. And so go to the next one. This is the way I think would have been, my dream would have been captured by Hollywood. Oh, stop right there. Uh, I met a guy at Hammond High. Hammond High School was one of the few schools within 20 miles of where I lived that had African American students. In my freshman class of 400, we had five African-American students. But of course, one of them was a great basketball player, and his name was Kenny Blackman. And Kenny and I teamed up together, and we were undefeated as freshmen at Hammond High School. And so, Kenny was the kind of guy 
you know, it was unique because there were only five African-American students to have a friendship that close with another African-American if you were a white guy. And so Kenny and I became very close friends. In regards to Kenny's color, he was like Martin Luther King had said, it was the content of Kenny's character. He would go to the mat for me or anybody else because of his character. So let's go to the next one. And this was, uh, uh, <clears throat> what are you doing? I'm doing two things. What? I'm looking at that book. This is Kenny and here's me. Woody Harrelson and Jesse Wright. They're in trouble. Okay. Now watch this. White men can't jump. White men can't jump. Now look at this. I could jump. So go to the next slide. <laughs> this is me. This guy is six foot six inches tall. I'm just over six foot. And look at this. I'm a foot above him. I could dunk the basketball. I could jump even though I was a white guy. Okay. So go to the next one. This is my, I think this is my dream. <laughs> you know, basketball in Indiana is legendary. There's 700 teams who all played for the same title. There was no distinction, Class A, B, C, D, or F. Everybody, 700 teams played for the state championship. It resulted in a movie when Milan won, and uh, they were a school of about 147, and they won it all, I think it was 1954 or 55. So this is my dream. Go to the next one. This is my dream. The dream, February 1960. Here's the dream. the next one. Just weeks after that particular dream, I ran down to the court. We were playing the number one team in the state of Indiana. These guys looked like they were Goliaths in jockey shorts. And here I was, you know, the boy David and I left my slingshot in the locker room. But believe me, for the next 32 minutes, I was had a miracle game. Go to the next slide, and let me show you this. This was me in that game. Here I am, the bespeckled number 30. This is my man. I have driven around him, and this guy, about six and a half foot tall, is intimidated by him. Look, he has to crouch down to get to my height. I was like Superman or, or Spider-Man for one game. I made 20 points against the best defensive man in the whole state of Indiana. This guy, the, he went on to be in the Indiana State High School Hall of Fame. He played for University of Michigan. He held the leading scorer, Western Michigan, Manny Newsom, to 13 points in 32 minutes. In college, in high school, I made 20 points in 32 minutes. This was a miracle. It was an unbelievable thing. So I wanted to get a basketball scholarship with 10 points a game. You know, you're not going anywhere. But I made 20 points in that game, and the coach at Rice University had a relative that lived in my part of Indiana, set that picture down, sent the stats. I made 8 out of 11 from the field, 405 free throw. It said this in the article. This is crazy. It said that I've been valedictorian of my graduating. Never, they don't put that in sports section. But he couldn't keep his players eligible. Right to the top school. And so he said, this is my man. And he sent me an offer for room, board, books, and fees. He even threw in $18 to clean my dirty laundry. The man made an offer I couldn't refuse. It was the only one I had. <laughs> And I was on my way. Go to the next one. Crash, Tim. I'm, I'm worried out. So here we go. Take our jet plane now. We're going to go from Indiana down here to Texas. We're going to experience. Here I go. I'm going down across the Arkansas, across Texarkana, Dallas, everything. I'm next down here right over Houston, Texas, and Rice University. My only offer. So here I am. And I come in, I remember that first day on campus, I walked on and went over to Audrey Field House and the Vice Basketball Radio. So there I was, I guess my first game against Georgia Tech. Uh, the Rice, not a big crowd here, but I remember I got the ball right there, and the Tech Center was guarding me. It was the first part of the second half, and I cocked my body like I'd done in high school and I unleashed this power that I thought I still had. I never left the floor. <laughs> I thought, what's happened? I this guy had stepped on the end of my tennis shoe. And so I lost my balance and I collapsed on my back. I catapulted a shot towards the basket. It hit the bottom of the net, 
stood in the second row of the right jury section, I made the first horizontal jump shot that had ever been attempted. Terrible! This is not my dream. So, uh, go to the next one. Okay, here again. Look at this. This is me. Wasn't I a good-looking cat in those days? <laughs> and this guy was seven foot. He went ten around. He went on the NBA. But here again, look at. You see any African American players? No. So in effect, I really <coughs> had to say benefit from segregation in the South. <laughs> because no Big Ten team that could recruit black players would have recruited me. And so I came down to Texas. Highly regarded, unfortunately. So go to the next one. And even the Houston Chronicle said, uh, see, I was an Indiana product, so I was going to be really an all-star. Oscar Robertson, Larry Bird, they were Indiana players. So I was going to be great. And because I was from Indiana, he came out to do a story on me. So go to the next one. So here's what happened as a result of my basketball career at Rice. This is sad to see. I told you about my horizontal jump shot, but now we're going up north where there are African-American players. We're going to play against Creighton University, Omaha, Nebraska, December 21st, 1961, I believe it was. So here I am. Here's the Omaha Fieldhouse. I come into the Fieldhouse. I sit there. I watch our team. We're playing Creighton. We're 37 points behind. And the coach says to me, so we're 37 points behind the coach. I made a mistake. I bent forward, Carla, and he saw me and he said, go into the ball game, Jerry. I looked up at the scoreboard, 37 points. What kind of damage could I do now? <laughs> well, Silas, they had this guy named Silas. Go to the next one. Here's the next one. <laughs> Frustration, discouragement, defeat. Here he is, Paul Sa all American. He went on to play in the NBA, set the rebounding mark, coached uh, Sh uh, Charlotte, something like that. So um, they said, "Go into the ball game, Jerry." I got into the ball game. My player, my teammate said, "Help! Switch! Help!" Well, his man was Paul Silas. Silas made one more basket. And he set a new auditorium mark, and I made the mistake. I took his. I took Silas. Silas looked up at the basket. I was in front of him. I said, "Does he see me?" The coach said, what you do is you throw your hands up in front of their face. Well, I did that. Well, then if that doesn't bother them, yell. Well, I yelled. But he took off like a small Nike rocket and carried me up on his chest, his cargo, the ball. <laughs> then he did a very unmerciful act. He jammed the ball high into the heavens, and he brought it down in a sledgehammer dunk. I'm on his chest. <laughs> so the ball tears open the net, bounds off my head. I lay back there like a dead Texas cockroach. <laughs> and I look, I said, there's no justice. There's no justice in the world. And all of <laughs> the referee kneels down and says, foul on you, number 30. <laughs> I'd like to capture that. Go to the next video. <laughs> to, to give you an idea how bad it was, this clip suggests what happened that night. <laughs> 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 Academically, I was doing badly. At Rice in basketball, I have a record to this day. I have the lowest shooting set percent anybody ever put on an out jersey. And my friend said, well, maybe nobody scored. I said, you remember the one time I scored, Larry, against Baylor? We can't forget it. It was the only time. <laughs> Kendall was under the basket, all seven foot of him. We had just seconds of the first time. I threw him a pass. Went over his hands into the basket. I scored a bad pass. I'm zero. I'm zero for 18. I had a dismal basketball career. Academically, I was doing worse. Differential equations. After great progress in high school, I was in the whole state of Indiana. I was 15th in mathematics. At Rice University, I laid the, made the lowest grade ever made in differential equations. I made not just an F. Five is not good at Rice. Five is F. 
I need an F minus. <laughs> Look, if I was on my back, did you talk about fares being an option? Well, it was an option I was proceeding toward quickly. So go to the next one. <laughs> So, President Kennedy in 1962, September 12, comes to Rice Stadium. My teammates say, hey, Jerry, let's go down and hear the president. Well, obviously, I wasn't going on the NBA. <laughs> so maybe I should see if I could maybe go to the moon in some form or fashion. So I went down there, and I, I uh, sat on the, I think about the 50-yard line. There are thousands there. Now, in order to capture that moment, I have recreated a five-minute version of what I heard him say. And I wanted to use his seal. Well, I got his seal, and I, 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 I wrote the White House to ask if I might be able to, uh, for my theatric presentation, use this, and they said, no. There's a regulation. If you use it, you lose your security clearance. You've got to retire early. And so what I did was, I got clever. I took his seal, and I created Jerry Woodfield's seal. This is a seal of a resident. <laughs> I took the P off. I took out the P, and so this is the residential seal of the President of the United States, John Kennedy. And so I started to capture this moment for you guys and how it changed my life. I have a brief recreation of it. I take my glasses off to look more Kennedy-esque. I tried to do something with my hair. I bought one of these things that's seen on TV where if you spray it on your hair, each hair follicle catches this stuff and it builds your hair into a beautiful head of hair. Well, I found out it didn't work too good during the hot summer days. But, I didn't look here. but here's what the president said. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists the world has ever known are alive and working today, Despite the fact that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years, despite that this vast stretches of the unknown and unanswered unfinished, far outstrip our collective comprehension, no man can fully grasp how far or how fast we have come. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but recreate new ills that dispels the old, new ignorance and new problems and new dangers. Surely the opening, this is the space, promised high cost and hardship, as well as high reward. And so it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. But this city of Houston and this state of Texas and this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. This country was conquered by those who moved forward and so was space. Now the exploration of space will go ahead whether we join it in it or not because it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space because the eyes of the world look to space and the moon and the planets beyond. But why some say the moon years ago? And why does Bryce play Texas? <laughs> we choose to go to the moon and do these other things not because they're easy, but because they are hot. Because that goal will organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're unwilling to postpone and one that we intend to do. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why he wanted to climb it. And he said, because it is there. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it, and the moon, and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. Now give President a hand. And so, this greatly benefited Rice University because I decided that I'd focus on trying to graduate, gave up my basketball scholarship, thank you President Kennedy, and I moved toward trying to graduate in my fifth year, fourth year, I had about between an A and a B average. And so, go to the next slide, as a result of that, uh, I did get myself to graduate, I became a NASA, NASA hired me, believe it or not, I became the failure engineer, isn't that appropriate? What a failure I was in basketball and academics. Your automobile before you sell oil flow as you have your arms. So I was 
And this is one I want to share with you real quick. Uh, this is one that comes from my career. Uh, we had a, a shuttle project, and the deal was it was called the Advanced Autopilot Experiment. And this was a new kind of a uh, avionics system that uh, wouldn't use the lookup tables for the selection of jets and so forth and gyros. What it did, it actually could take anything that happened, any thrust effector on board, if it actually even moved swiftly on board, it would integrate all those effectors and come out with a way of controlling the vehicle. But you had to be able to test the thing. And so to test the thing, what we had envisioned doing was let Woody spring, get in the cargo bay, and he was going to release this thing, we called it a blivet, and it was basically going to be a target. So they could point the uh, RMS camera on it, and Rudy would be very careful to just to release it and not give any kind of a moment of movement to it. And then we could move the shuttle, rotate it, and see if this autopilot was actually doing its job. Well, we went to test this thing out at uh, Ellington Field, and it was in dark at night. So you hold my light here, okay? And it was dark that night, and uh, it was, uh, they, I got about 100, I think it was Woody Spring, and then I think Jerry Ross was one of the guys, and Mary Cleave, and a uh, fellow that's the head of, uh, was it Boeing for a while, or uh, one of the astronauts? Shaw, Rooster Shaw. Okay, so we were out there, and they said, uh, Jerry, would you uh, rotate that thing? Oh, I never thought about that. I could have come up with some very clever mechanism, you know, and maybe gotten some kind of an award for it. Didn't think about that. And so I thought, what am I going to do? Well, I, I played golf in those days. And I had pretty. Before I went, I said, Lord, I, I need some help. And these are astronauts, you know, and I, I, I want to impress them. Well, I had prayed, and I had that thing out there. I said, well, Ron, take the thing, will you? They were a long way off, you know. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do now? That's pretty, man. I said, hey, I played golf yesterday. And I said, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if I still have it. I mean, I have it today. If I have a team, and I have this team right here, and if I put it right there in the top of the, the blue bit, like that, and I said, I could rotate, it, but i got to have another team. Lord, are you going to help me out? And here it was! And after the 18th hole, I didn't you know, change my pants, I guess. I've been holding you know, this red thing. <laughs> And so I, I had another key, you know, and so I put it to the bottom, you know. And this was the perfect mechanism to rotate it and keep it stable. I said, thank you, Lord. But I had to thank somebody else. So go to the next slide. <laughs> I'm just showing this. That's who I want to thank. Mr. George Granite Dennis, who in 1899 invented the golf team that saved my NASA career in these internal astronauts. Okay, so thank you, George. Okay, God bless you. Go to the next one. This may be a one-hit wonder in this program. <laughs> so, okay, now, this is a thing I want to share because it's from my personal experience about music. Uh, back in the early 60s, folk music was really popular, and I believe because of it, it did much to help to bring equality to uh, all America for, for the black community and African-American community. And these were some of our favorites in those days. Bob Dylan, uh, most of you aren't my age. I'm by far the oldest one in the room. I've reached 70. I'm going on 71. And uh, in order to capture that moment, I went on the Internet and I recalled that Bob Dylan used to wear these real crazy hats. So here's my Bob Dylan hat, which you know, I've got a little NASA work on it. i got to, you know, and my wife helped me with this thing. And, and you can, I got it over at the gift shop. And uh, I saw in my church, I saw a lady had one of these things on. I asked her where she got it. Well, she said, I got it at Claire's. I said, what's Claire's? I said, it's a lady's, lady's hat. Well, okay, I went and it's 32 bucks. I didn't love it that much. <laughs> so I went by Target, and here it was, 14.95. Well, that's a little bit better. Then my wife and I sometimes on weekends go over to, uh, uh, to this place called the Guild, Research. That's a good place to get neat things. And there was one, this thing here, pretty bad, but it's $7.50. Still got the tag on it. So I bought it for our program today. So this is what I look in it, like in it, you know. Kind of ridiculous. Catch that for the roundup, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are some of the songs. Now this song, let me tell you about these songs, the lyrics of these songs. Uh, this Times Are a Change in song is really terrific. <laughs> Oh, 
gather around the people wherever you roam. Now here's the lyric I wanted to share with you because it's prophetic. The second verse goes like this. It says, Come writers and critics who prophesy with your pen, keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again, and don't speak too soon, for the wheels still in spin, and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win, for the times they are changing. Now how could he have known that our president would be Barack Obama, an African American, who proud, we can be proud of that. God bless him. And so I wanted to share that with you. But this post music had a big time. You remember this one? If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening. Or it's when I'd hammer out danger. I'd hammer out warning. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. Oh, oh, oh. But here again, about love all over this land. How many roads? <laughs> this is the one we have worked with before. Well, anyway, it went like this. I warned it worse than ever told a lie. I learned it. Boy, we got through it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, I die a thousand deaths every time I do one of these things. Use a study of it. But the biggest thing that happened was I could see things where God answered prayer in unique ways, and I knew about him because I was involved in the rescue. As a result of that, I found a friend. And I discovered uh, Ron McNair. And this is what impressed me. I read his book. And I had met Ron McNair out here. And he always had a smile on his face. And when uh, you see him, you knew there was something in his heart. And I had read his book, and his book said this. His grandmother. After Ron was celebrated in his hometown in South Carolina, his grandmother said, Now, Ron, you know, you've achieved much, but you really haven't shared who made it possible. And from that point on, Ron never failed to give credit to his Lord. And Ron impressed me. And Ron is a friend that I guess you'd call him out of season because now he's passed on. He's won up to his reward, as President uh, said. He's touched the face of God. Go to the next one. And, yeah, I study the Bible a lot. I do more of that than anything. And uh, I have two sons. One's a pastor and the other's a, a lawyer. So if I get in trouble with the law, I got my lawyer to call. If I get in trouble with the Lord, I have my pastor to pray for <laughs> so, so I study the Bible. And in the Bible, they list all these champions of the faith. You know, there's Abraham, of course, and, and Seth, Samson, and Rahab, and... And none of these people are perfect. They're just like me. You know, they may say, they sin just like I do. But God forgives them if we ask and so forth. And so I, I saw this thing in the Bible. It's Hebrews 11. I turned to it. Moses is in there. as one of the heroes of the faith. So if you read this about Moses, he came to his He refused to be called, the son, you know, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And then it said, He esteemed the reproach of Christ, but by faith He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, and so forth. So I took that, and I looked at those words, and I prayed for the Lord, and He showed me, you know, Martin Luther King, a lot of people have seen this, but I saw it, because there was a, the head of the Lunar Lander program, I found this out early in my NASA career, he had a huge picture, he was a white man, he had a huge picture of Martin Luther King in his living room, and one of my colleagues that worked in Flight Fuel Support, he had been over this, he couldn't understand why a white man would have Martin Luther King, you know, his picture in his living room. And in those days, this would be about the mid century very unusual. I never understood it. So I began to read about Martin Luther King, I read his autobiography, and then I knew that he was, for example, he was like God had made him sort of the Moses of the African-American people. So go to the next one. And this is Moses. You know, this is a picture of Moses parting the Red Sea. Go to the next one. Look at this. You know, it's almost, it's almost 
unique. You know, it's got to be providential. Well, that was April of 1968. Go to the next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some very sad news for you. And I think sad news for people all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and killed tonight. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and justice. To peace, and he gave himself in that cause. I shall ask you to return to your homes, that's true, and say a prayer for Martin Luther King's family. But more importantly, let's say a prayer for this nation which all of us love. A prayer for understanding and those principles that Martin Luther King looked about. Some men see things as they are and they say, why? Some men see things as they are not and they say, why not? So go to the next slide. So Martin Luther King, now we have Americans 11 from Jerry Woodville. Read this. My faith Martin, when he was come to years, refused to, to be called the son of culture and erudite learning, chose rather to suffer affliction with his people of the South than to enjoy the pleasures of opportunity and acceptance in the society of the North, esteeming the reproach of his calling in Christ as greater riches than the treasures and comforts of scholarship and position, for he had respect unto the recompense of the Lord, and by faith he forsook the land of the faint-hearted, not fearing the wrath of the persecutors, for he endured as seeing his dream maker, who is invisible. Through faith he kept that dream alive and saw the shedding of blood throughout his land, lest he that destroyed his people should be victorious over them by faith, though they be slain, he and they pass through their Red Sea as by dry land, that they might one day say, at last, everybody, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last, and that's for all of us. Go to the next one. I get excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, in my home now hangs the picture of Martin Luther King with honor. And each time I look at that, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of our country. I'm proud of every African American and all those that helped this come to pass. So I just say praise the Lord and here's the last slide. Jesse, Kenny, Ron, and Martin. These are four of my American heroes. Go to the next one. Apollo 13 flight controllers. This number. You go, no, go for lunch. Character. Equality. Respect. Brotherhood. Fairness. Kindness. Equal rights. Honesty. kids and you'd like it, I'll sure uh, make those available to you. So Carla, help me get them out here. Here they are, a whole bag full of them. And while I do this, we're going to have a presentation. Okay. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And on behalf of the AAERG, we'd like to present this to you in appreciation for your participation in the Johnson Space Center's Black History Month Observant Event. Okay. God bless you. Hey, before you leave, would you sign it?